Hello, this is Paul Check. Welcome back to my video blog series, my endless series of video blogs, which I hope you enjoy. We cover a wide variety of topics from body to emotion to mind to spirit to environment and much, much more. Today, I thought I would talk about gym time. How much is enough? There is a lot of controversy on that, a lot of different belief systems. There's all sorts of research. As usual, some of it conflicts, which is very normal in the research endeavors or scientific community. So I thought I would share some of my experience and wisdom in regard to this issue with you in hopes that you can make more intelligent decisions and get better results with your time in a gym. So today I will start with part one where I get into things that you need to be aware of such as stress factors, how the body summates stress, and I will talk about cortisol, I'll talk about other factors that are involved in calculating how to determine how much exercise is ideal. So before I get into it, I have a model here. Uh, you can get a lot of this information on total stress accumulation from my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. It's on, there's a chart on page 190 and a whole chapter on stress. Uh, it's currently out of print and is about to come off the press with a new updated edition, which I've added the essential four doctor elements to. So look for that very soon. If you're watching this in months or years from now, it probably is already out. So what we want to do is, one, my primary reference here when I'm speaking of gym time, how much is enough, is focusing more on resistance training than on endurance training. It's not unusual at all for endurance athletes to do long workouts. For example, 90-minute workouts, even longer, depending on the type of athlete and the type of training or the phase of training that they're in, although... That said, many of the things that I will say as far as stress management and, and awareness of how your body's responding apply to every athlete, no matter what sport they're in. And these things apply to every human being because for, from my perspective, everyone's an athlete. It's just what kind of athlete you are. You might be a, a mother athlete who chases after kids all day. You might be a carpenter athlete, a bricklayer athlete, a mechanic athlete, etc. So the principles apply, it's just how you apply them is specific to the needs of the individual and what they're trying to accomplish. So I'm going to give you some basics to work with to help frame the discussion, and then we will look at a mock-up of different types of workout exposures. So I'm going to begin by just saying right up front what I've found through years and years of experimenting with myself and many others and keeping very detailed records and monitoring things like morning heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, performances from workout to workout and um, program to program and uh, cycle to cycle training athletes, often very elite athletes is that generally you shouldn't spend more than an hour in the gym from the time you walk into the gym to the time you walk out of the gym. So that would use, include your warm-up. In some cases, I will extend that to say that the training time starts once your warm-up is finished, but that depends on how healthy, balanced, and ready the athlete is. Now, when I say warm-up, that includes mobilization of joints and stretching as needed to balance the body. Sometimes, some athletes have to spend 35 or 40 minutes because they're in a restorative phase, so that would only leave them 20 minutes to train. So depending on what the nature of the individual is and their overall stress profile, I make those decisions. Based on my observation and work with athletes and people in general, if you need to get more time in a gym to accomplish an objective and you want to avoid the negative effects of elevated stress hormones, which are things like adrenaline, adrenaline 
and cortisol are the glucocorticoid family. There's multiple glucocorticoids, so I'm just using cortisol kind of as a heading of stress hormones. Um, what you'll find is it's better to do two shorter workouts a day. Years ago, when I was deep in research and all this stuff, I was looking at um, hormonal profiles of elite Russian Olympic weightlifters, and they showed typically that those athletes who were training 90 minutes or more a day started having negative responses due to excessive cortisol accumulation. And one of the things that was noticed in the research was that there was a greater incidence of injury after about three weeks of training. And if athletes didn't back it down and get some rest, they were in trouble. I've actually heard Charles say personally in times when he, we were either teaching a workshop together or I was consulting for him or one of his athletes or spending time with him, uh, he has a little cliche, if you're in the gym longer than an hour, you're not training, you're making friends. So that's a general quote from Charles Polican, who most of you know is a world famous strength coach who's trained hundreds of Olympic athletes. So what I want to do now is get into some of the things that you all need to know to know when your time in the gym is actually productive versus being uh, not only potentially unproductive, but even damaging. And if you have a habit of doing too much in the gym relative to your awareness that you are probably um, not getting good results, then you might want to consider that you may have an exercise addiction. In my methodology and terminology, an addiction is any repeated behavior that does not produce the results you want. So if you're going to the gym and you're one of these people that comes up to me and says, Paul, no matter how hard in the, I train in the gym, I can't put muscle on. Or Paul, no matter how hard I train in the gym, I can't seem to stop getting injured or I can't seem to heal such and such an injury. Those are all leaders that as a therapist immediately make me think this person is medicating themselves with exercise and there's a deeper issue that is being avoided and needs to be identified and addressed. Or what you get is a person who comes, pays a lot of money for good therapeutic advice, goes to the gym and continues to do what they've always done, which is not only expensive, but it doesn't work. <laughs> so there you go. So now we're going to look at the model here. This is a stress bucket. Research conclusively shows that all stresses in the human body mind summate. They add up. So there is no such thing as gym stress that is exclusive of all the other stresses of your life, be it food stress, digestive stress, relationship stress, money stress, dot, dot, dot. We're still pretty paleolithic in our holistic understanding of exercise in general, and that's even true at the most elite level. I'm qualified to say that because I've been a consultant to too many professional sports teams, athletes, Olympic committees and organizations to even count or rattle off. So I've had a close look inside at the highest level of elite sports. And there's still, uh, unfortunately, a very strong no pain, no gain attitude, which is slowly healing. So what we want to remember then is the more stress we accumulate the worse our response to exercise is and the closer to death we bring ourselves. When we're down here in the green, it means we have an optimal workout response. And there's where we apply the Charlie Francis 1% to 3% rule, which says if you cannot improve your performance in the gym over your last workout by 1% to 3%, you do not belong in a gym you are actually working against yourself. This, as I alluded to earlier, is particularly important for strength athletes and power athletes, or those that tend to use high intensity, high resistance type training, and even bodybuilders. Uh, bodybuilders have a lot of problems in this whole area that I'm talking about. Um, because you're using 
high enough intensities to break a lot of muscle and connective tissue down. And whenever you break a lot of tissue down, you need a fairly high level of cortisol to help uh, do the cleanup work. Cortisol is a catabolic hormone that acts to repair or clean up the injury site to lay new tissue down just the way a good painter will scrape a house or sandblast a house to get all the old paint off before putting new paint on. So the same way you can scrape right through the wall or sandblast your way through the wall and ruin the wall of the house, if you have too much cortisol, it starts to actually degrade and degenerate the tissue. And those of you that are savvy to sports medicine or have had the experience of physicians injecting things like rotator cuff tendons, patella tendons, knees, backs. The research showed that you should never use more than three cortisol injections within a given period of time, probably about a year in my opinion, because it increases the risk of tissue damage or breakage very, very high. So there you see an example of too much cortisol being tissue destructive. Cortisol has basically a cleanup function. It's also an activating hormone. So its yang function is it stimulates the reticular activating system and the brain to wake you up and give you a lot of action. And ideally, most people's cortisol reaches peak level sometime between the time they get up and about noon. Ideally for me, I find working out at about 10 to 10.30 is when I feel my best, my most alert, and feel physically most responsive to fairly hard exercise. The later in the day I go, the more, um, shall we say, less motivated and less um, jacked up or pumped up or um, secure inside myself. For example, if I'm gonna go do heavy deadlifts, I, I don't wanna try to do that late in the afternoon unless I'm just begging for trouble. Early in the morning, it takes a while to wake up. So you, do, every one of you will be a little different at the pace and nature of how you turn yourself on. Another thing is if you're having to use coffee, tea, or stimulants just to get yourself going in the morning, that's an indication that you're already in trouble and probably are suffering, suffering from adrenal fatigue and chronically low levels of cortisol. So the yang function of cortisol is that it activates the system and if it's in too high a levels, cortisol has a precursor, which is adrenaline, then it, it can make you anxious and nervous and give you kind of an ADD type mind and make it very hard for you to learn new things because it switches you into a stress reaction profile, which gives you left brain type dominance, which is basically doing what you've always done instead of changing behavior to something productive. The feminine aspect is that it controls inflammation. It helps reduce inflammation. But if you get too much cortisol in you, not only is it tissue destructive, your liver has to detoxify your own cortisol. So if you push any hormone up too high, it actually becomes toxic to the body, and that's another form of stress. Now, there's a lot about cortisol, so I'll leave it right there because I think that's enough. So when we look at what goes into ourselves as stressors each day, if you look at the six foundation principles that I teach in my holistic lifestyle coaching program, we have three yin and three yang. Those are just generalizations. We use nutrition, hydration, and sleep as our chief means of bringing in the nutrients and getting the time and energy accumulation we need to restore the body we breathe to excite the system, we move to get things done, and we think to get things done, and thinking can be more stressful than anything else you can do. Considering the average person thinks 68,000 thoughts a day, of which 90% are negative based on research, um, you can see that the mind can actually be the most dangerous thing to anyone's athletic pursuits. If the we need a normal amount or a useful amount of stress, sometimes called eustress for useful stress, to keep our bodies healthy and grow. If we don't get stress of the mind, then we don't develop our mental abilities. If we don't stress with movement, we, we get too weak for the environment that we are in or want to be in. If we don't breathe effectively, our biochemistry gets screwed up 
We're more likely to uh, binge eat. We're more likely to resort to stimulants, sugars, and, and quick energy sources. If we don't get enough sleep, we can't recharge our batteries, and we can't repair our bodies effectively. There's a whole chapter on sleep in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, that's very informative. And if we don't adequately hydrate, our biochemistry starts to uh, have problems. Our pH can become more acidic, facilitating more inflammation. And we can become uh, dangerously toxic, as Robert Rakowski, the famous chiropractor who's lectured for years for Metagenics, says the best solution for pollution is dilution, and water is nature's greatest solvent. So we need to remember that. And I go through applications of all these in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and my Four Doctors book, and take you deeper into the application of a variety of these basic principles in HLC1 and check Exercise Coach, which is our entry-level advanced training program for those of you wanting to master the science and application of exercise for yourself or as a trainer, strength coach, or uh, as a general theme, or even rehabilitation. Now, we not only have nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement, and our management of that and the influences of that contributing to our overall readiness or lack of readiness for exercise, we have thermal issues. The thermoregulatory system is the most energy consumptive system in the human body. There's many parts of your body involved in thermal regulation. Today, we have tremendous problems with people being chronically inflamed. And one of the big reasons for that is their food choices. A lot of processed food and the food additives, preservatives, colorings, emulsifiers, and stabilizers are gastrointestinal, inflammatory, and inflammatory in general. Then you got medical drugs, and you got recreational drugs, and you got toxins in the environment, and uh, you, you've got electromagnetic pollution that can increase body temperature by agitating cells. Um, if you want to learn more about the e electromagnetic pollution effects, then look at Nick Peanault's new book, The uh, Tinfoil Guide to Electromagnetic Pollution, or something like that. Penny will put the proper title on the screen. Best book out there on the topic. And we've got environmental factors. We've got electromagnetic factors also in the sun. So if you don't get enough sun, that's stressful. If you get too much and get a burn, that's stressful. So we've got environmental toxicity and chemicals both in our diet and in our environment. And I won't have time to go into that, but there is, last time I checked, something like 68,000 chemicals being added to food, which is pretty shocking. And then you got farming chemicals, you got medical drugs, you got chemicals in buildings. Research says it's about 10 times safer uh, as far as pollution goes, to be outside of any building than it is inside the building. So sometimes the older the building, the better, because it's outgassed, but they also have a lot of lead in the paints in old buildings and asbestos in walls and things like that. So the rule is that there's a lot of toxicity in our environments, even when we aren't aware of it. Next, we have to remember that the way we are wired to distribute our energies is first in relationship to meeting our own needs, our survival needs, so I needs. Then once those needs are met, we can distribute our energy into relationships. So we means me and my wife, or me and my friend, or me and my coworker. As a general rule, all relates to three people or more and or to issues of the world. So, for example, if you go to a rally because you don't want a certain president, or you go to a rally against a abortion, um, or uh, against uh, or for abortion, or whatever your position is, if it's something social, you're operating at the all level. If you're a school teacher, you're automatically operating at the all level every day, which means you're dealing with a lot of we's and you be, need to be very conscious of your personal needs because the lower you get on energy or the more stressed you get, 
the more people you engage with, the more they draw out of you, and pretty soon you can end up uh, burning yourself out, gaining weight in response to it, and making the big mistake that's made by countless millions of people all the time on any given day, and that's go to the gym and try to work out harder to burn the fat off, which usually results in injury or short-term weight loss with a rebound weight gain, or, as I've seen in countless cases, they're training harder and harder and get, getting bigger and bigger because when we're in a stress response, we tend to hold on to water and may even add fat, especially the females are more susceptible to get us through the perceived war or famine or threat that the nervous system uh, recalls on our genetics and our history to try to interpret. We, we've been through all sorts of wars, famines, and earth events in the past, so the body starts planning to try to protect you, which usually uh, that stress response doesn't look good in the mirror and leads to frustration. And then people start doing things like, uh, you know, packaged or canned or uh, pill bottles of metabolic stimulators or trying bull magic bullets and just getting themselves in a lot deeper trouble, usually to frying their adrenal glands and causing all sorts of things, which typically leads to hypothyroidism, by the way. Okay. So we've got all these stress factors playing in, and then we've got our stress hormone response. So if our, stress, if, we're, if our stresses are optimal, like I said, we can train hard. If we're getting into the yellow zone with total stress response, we're fragile, and we have less readiness to train and improve by 1% to 3%. If we get to the red zone, we're in a state of fatigue, depletion, and injury is highly likely if you haven't already maintained, uh, created, or are trying to maintain one from that behavior. In the second half, I'll get it more into an understanding of what happens when we train too frequently or train with too much intensity or train with too much duration too frequently in the gym. And I'll talk about ways you can manipulate that, some things to do to look at to monitor your body and give you some closing tips to support you in optimizing your exercise investment, and I will share resources with you as I go along.